Greetings, Crackpotters. It is I, the Crackpot Farmer. We are over at the Blend Station today, and there's an awful lot of things to talk about, like the non-discriminatory biological genocide machine right there, or all of that nonsense over there, and those things up there, as well as some things in there. But we're not going to talk about those things today. We're going to talk about something else. We're going to talk about something that I promised I would talk about last time that we showcased this tractor. And that was this little box right here. So before we can talk about that little box right there, we are going to look at a couple of very crude diagrams. Actually, before we do that, we should look at one piece up on top of this machine first. Don't find the critical freedom infrastructure. See the little white bubble there? That is the antenna for the GPS. So yes, we are talking about the GPS today. So over here on top of the barrels, I have drawn a couple of diagrams to kind of sort of explain what exactly is going on here. So a GPS, or Global Positioning System, they've been around for quite a while. They've been around for many years actually, the military has been using them forever, and people have been listening to a voice saying, recalculating, for years. So how do we use these in agriculture? Well, in ways we're kind of lazy, <laughs> we would rather a machine drive our tractor for us than we do. It's actually a lot more complicated than that. When a machine is driving our tractor, like say in a straight line, because with a sprayer, you can't exactly see where you've been because it's just spraying a little bit. So there's no tillage pass, there's no, uh, the crop isn't cut by a combine or something. You can't see where you've been. So a GPS allows you to spray more efficiently and we'll get into the very details of that in a bit. But anyways, so back to the GPS itself. So how it works, we have the antenna on top of my beautifully drawn tractor here. And what this antenna does is it receives signals from a number of satellites and it uses triangulation to know where it is. So this satellite sends out a signal and that signal has a timestamp on it. And the antenna on the tractor picks up that signal and the timestamp and it calculates how long it took that signal to travel from here to here. Because it knows how fast the signal can travel, if it knows the time it took, it can then calculate this distance actually fairly accurately. So once we have more than one satellite, one here, one there, one there, we can actually get a good idea of where we are. Here comes the second diagram. So this is a top-down view of this. So here is my tractor. So it talks to this satellite, so it knows that we're this number of distance from this satellite, and then this number of distance from this one, and this number of distance from this one. From there it is now triangulated where exactly it is. Now we can do this in three dimensions as well, can do it up and down obviously because it knows how that functions. Now the satellites are actually geo-referenced, they're stationary satellites on the globe that then tell these satellites where exactly they are, so they can tell uh, my tractor where they are so my tractor knows where in relation it is to them. So around the globe kind of looks like this there's a whole pile of these satellites because they are traveling a lot of them are not geostationary or they're supposed to be in geosynchronous orbit but they're not they move a little bit so they have to be uh, referenced and corrected but that's how it looks around the globe so we have satellites all over the place so no matter where we end up around the globe we always have quite a few that we can pick from. So these signals are actually subject to a little bit of interference uh, in the ionosphere, I believe is the name of it, which is that layer just outside or just inside of our Earth's atmosphere that contains things like weather patterns and clouds and all those kinds of things. I believe that's the ionosphere. I could, yes, ionosphere. The stratosphere is next one up. It's the ionosphere that gives us the most trouble. Now, we are but peasant farmers, and we use a lot of trimble equipment, which is, you could call it your entry level stuff, I guess. It's not super expensive, like the John Deere stuff, and it works about as well as you expect. Pretty decently, but not perfect. We do experience some problems. So here is our swanky FM750 GPS interface. So this thing talks to the control module on top of the cab, sorry, the antenna on top of the cab, which talks to satellites to know where exactly it is. So this thing does all the work of interpreting all those signals and figures out where exactly it is on the globe. So once it's figured out where exactly that antenna is sitting in on the globe, then it has one more quick calculation that it has to do before it knows exactly where it is, and then that signal can be useful to us. So up on top of the tractor is the antenna. Now you see the tractor is reasonably tall, and if you put that antenna on say maybe the top of the combine, which is 13 foot six to the top of the cab, and you take the combine, you tilt it a little bit, you will find that that antenna is no longer in the center line of travel. In fact, it can be off by like, you know, a foot or two feet. Now, if we're trying to be reasonably accurate, and this Trimble system is usually accurate to within about six inches or so, so if we're trying to be reasonably accurate, we need to take that tilt into accommodation. 
So, or sorry, into consideration. That's the word I was looking for. Come on, brain, try to keep up to the mouth. So underneath the seat in here, which we probably will not be able to see, is a little box called the Terrain Compensation Module. And, oh, we can actually probably just about see it. It is hiding down there. And that little terrain compensation module, what it does, it has gyroscopically stabilized sensors in it. And it just makes sure that it knows if it's leaning to the side or if it's upright or if it's leaning forwards. And it just tells the uh, GPS unit how to compensate for that so that it knows how to keep the tires on the center line. Because where the antenna is isn't really important in my line of travel. It's where are the tires because that's what actually matters. So now I guess we will head out to the field. I'll show you guys a video quick of how we get this set up for a new field. I'm not sure how well you'll be able to hear because this is just on a phone, not with my fancy camera. So uh, there probably won't be a whole lot of talking, but you will get the idea of it. Okay, let's get this set up for a new field. Yes, we're all finished with the current field. Create new field, pattern type. We want a headland and we will explain how this works as we go. Uh, yes, headland, 134 feet wide because that's the sprayer width. Internal A plus and we want 270 because that's the direction we want to go two circuits headland. Yep Uh-huh. Yep. There we go. Okay I just have to go out and flip my nozzles around from my 10 gallons to the five gallons and then we will go get this party started One Two Three 79 to go Okay, we are rocking and rolling in the field Neighbors rocking and rolling in his field over there. That's Rick and their 66 foot seed chicken going seeding. So headland pattern. We went all the way around the perimeter of the field once. Uh, bump, 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 go for holes. And now we're coming back upon where we started. Now I'm going to try and do this two handed operation with one hand so that you guys can kind of sort of watch. I am driving. See, my hands on wheel. We can even disengage easy steer if you want. Sorry for shaky camera. It is bumpy in here and I can only do so many things. And I'm trying to watch something that's 77 feet away from me or so and trying to keep it in a little area. Okay, so it has now completed the headland. So the really cool thing is with the way I started this is that I can turn, turning, and see how good I am at this. I think I missed, nope, I think it's fairly close. I'm usually much better when I'm actually driving and not trying to make a video. So once we get close, you'll watch that button in the bottom right turn orange, and we can push it, beep, and now the machine is driving. So now we will finish our headland, like so. I will turn the corners, but we will finish the headland, and then we'll start going back and forth. Okay, so here goes the corner. I've slowed down a gear, so life's a little bit easier. So I'll show you how we turn an inside corner. Yes, I am. I don't know about you, but can you see where 5.8 gallons per acre is? Because I certainly can't see it. I, I can't see the difference. So that's doing a lot better than I would have been. It's just because the line on the edge of the field isn't straight. That's fine. There will be no more overlaps from here on. So I just want to point out something quick before we finish filming in the tractor. And that's that this box and this box can work together. This is GPS, this is sprayer box. And a lot of the newer, more modern machinery, the GPS will turn on and off your implements for you. Now, we don't want to spend the extra $10,000 it would cost to get this, to run this, because the advantages of it really come when you have lots of obstacles to go around, but there are exactly two in this almost 300 acre field, so it's not really worth it. But what I have done is I have gotten, when I turn the switch off for the sprayer, it actually turns the paint off on the GPS, so it actually shuts off and stops doing with the yellow stuff. And that is because sometimes when I would turn the GPS off, or actually when I turn it, re-engage the GPS, push the green button, 
I would forget to turn the paint on or the paint off when I turned the sprayer on or off. And I couldn't tell if I'd been somewhere, especially if we had to go around a slough or something. I couldn't see where I had been. And so then I talked to our local dealer and did a couple little things, bought a relay and some wiring and got these two to talk to each other. But yeah, a lot of the modern stuff, the GPS actually controls the implement so that you uh, don't have any overlap or underlap even when you come to corners and stuff. We're not quite that sophisticated, but we don't really need it either. So when I'm wrapped up the field, I'll uh, talk to you guys quick again in the yard. Okay, so earlier I said that I would talk a little bit about why we use GPSs other than the fact that we're lazy. So in farming, we have a lot of costs and some of those are our diesel fuel that we burn, <laughs> the chemicals that we have to buy to use, <laughs> and the fertilizer that we use. <laughs> so we want to try to use as little of all of those things as we can. And so one of the ways we can do that is to make our machines as efficient as absolutely possible. So if our machines are overlapping and we're applying more fertilizer or chemical and burning more diesel than is necessary, that's a bit of wasted expense. So we wanna make sure our machines are not overlapping or underlapping, because that's not utilizing the ground then. We wanna make sure that they're pretty much running perfectly all the time. So I said with the sprayer, you, can, you can't see where you've been. So the sprayer was the first machine that dad got a GPS put in and it was wonderful, it was amazing, because before that they used a foam marker, so literally a foam line that was laid on the ground for you to look over and go, eh, yeah, I think I can see it. And uh, that's how they did spraying. Um, but actually before the foam marker, sorry, I'll distract it here. Before the foam marker, they had a disc on the end of the boom that actually made a line in the dirt and you kept the outer wheel of the sprayer boom in that line. So, um, so yeah, we got GPS in the sprayer first. And then after we had GPS in the sprayer, then we went and put it in the air seeder because they were putting out fertilizer with that. And actually it was because my brother and I are kind of young when we first started driving the air seeder and we weren't doing a very efficient job. We were squiggling all over the place and underlapping and overlapping all the time. So dad's like, hey, let's throw one of these suckers in uh, the seeder tractor as well. And then we put one in the combine because one year we were combining mustard. I believe it was dad was driving. Yes, it was dad that was driving. And he was only able to really see like right in front of him, not like 20 feet away, right in front of him. And he's on a field with sloughs and power poles. And at night, the dust was so bad, he couldn't see anything. So he's taking half passes with a 36 foot header and he can go one way and then he turns around, comes back empty and then does a half pass going the other way. It, he was literally 25% or less efficient. So then we put GPS in the combines. And now, as long as you knew whereabouts in the field you were, the combine's going in the right direction and it's traveling in a straight line and the header is always full. So now you can be a lot more efficient. And we found that you're then doing a better job of operating the combine and you can go faster. So what all this really summed up uh, to mean is that we spend less money on the inputs that we have to use and we can actually sometimes go faster with the machinery that we're using because we don't have to focus on steering it. So yeah, it looks kind of silly that we're using a computer to drive our tractor for us, like how difficult is it to drive a tractor? But it actually is very important and it can save us a lot of money and it can mean that we can run a lot longer days back to back without a whole lot of fatigue. So that is the five-ish minutes or more version of how the farm GPS works and why we use it. Thanks for watching and we'll talk more about the non-discriminatory biological genocide machine and the crap that we put in it in a future video.